As May arrives in the western part of India, it summons the hottest time of the year. It's the dry season. The El Nino weather condition is having its effect, and India is facing the hottest summer recorded. Time for me to head towards a place that has captivated my heart for a long time. The Western Ghats, a place I fell in love with from the time I saw it 15 years ago. The summer nesting birds like this blue-bearded bee-eater are busy feeding their young before arrival of the wet season, when it will become difficult for them to hunt. A Malabar whistling thrush, trying to look around from a better vantage point to sing. The Malabar giant squirrel. Early mornings are the best times around here starting with the songs of the Malabar whistling thrush, singing well before sunrise with its wonderful whistles. People in the guards call it the whistling schoolboy for the very human-like element in its songs. What drives me to the guards each year is a small bird, the smallest of the kingfishers of Asia and undoubtedly the most beautiful one of all. The Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher, or the ODK as we call it. Down below the guards, farmers start to work in their fields. Their actions are in anticipation of the monsoon, the giver of life. The monsoon is tied to the farmer's faith and to the whole economy of India. Early mornings is peak feeding time these days before the arrival of the monsoon, as everyone needs to feed before it gets too hot. The cumulonimbus start to appear. It's been months since the last rains. All are waiting for the rains to deliver life to these guards. It's June. Pre-monsoon showers provide necessary respite to the parched land. Not yet monsoons in their full glory. By now, monsoons would have arrived in the southern state of Kerala. The Pitta is happily drenched in the first rains of the season. Even a Malabar pit viper enjoys the taste of the first rains. The monsoon is here, the season of rebirth. The ODK pair get active as soon as the monsoon showers arrive. The pair are normally seen chasing each other around, but it's difficult to follow them in this thick forest. The downpours get heavier and more frequent. However, you can hear them chasing each other, even if you can't see them. They get very vocal during this period. For everyone, the long wait is over. The season of life has arrived in the guards.
To be up here is incredible, just watching the amazing spectacle of nature. The orchids have been waiting for the rains. They bloom in the first few days of the arrival of the monsoons. The ODKs have become very active now and can be seen hunting. They are getting ready to start their nesting soon. Every morning as I arrive in the guards, it's so refreshing to see the monsoon showers. Rainwater cascades from the guards. An Iora watches from its nest. The muddy water from the guards reaches the reservoirs at lower reaches. Underneath the surface, fish become active. The rainwater stimulates their instincts to breed, but they need to migrate upstream to spawn. One fish starts, and that triggers the migration up the waterfall. These gara only need a thin film of water to climb. The waterfall tends to push them back each time, yet the toughest and the most resilient manage to make it up this treacherous obstacle. The ODK will only start their breeding when the fish are in the upper reaches of the guards. I hear calls of the common kingfisher. Here they are, two males. They are trying to establish their territory as it's the start of the breeding season for them. Perform wing and necking displays to establish their dominance. If this doesn't work, they may get into a physical fight. Normally, physical fights are avoided, as injuries may lead to the loss of opportunity to breed that season. In the natural world, prime breeding territory is everything and is worth fighting for. As evening draws near, the clouds roll in and start to dominate the landscape. Rains start. A huge thunderstorm continues throughout the whole night. Morning springs a new surprise. A bounty of winged termites emerge from their mounds. A mantis just misses out. They have grown wings and are now out to disperse and form their own new colonies. Their emergence proclaims that the time of plenty is here. The ODK is also not slow to grab this opportunity of a free meal. The escaping termites are one of the monsoon's many gifts. Fortunately for the termites, it only takes two termites to form a brand new colony. India is highly dependent on agriculture and needs the monsoon rains to give life to the land. Looking at the consistent rains, the farmers plant rice in one corner of their field. Here it's allowed to grow up to a certain height and then distributed over the fields. The ODK pair have started their courtship ritual. The male needs to feed the female to prove that he can provide food during the raising of the young.
The ODK courtship continues for the next few days as the bond is reinforced. One unique thing about the ODK is that it only has three toes. The ODK, previously it was referred to as the three-toed kingfisher. Once the pair are committed to each other, they start one of the most tedious tasks of all digging a nest. Both the birds take equal part in the nest building process. The nest is dug into the mud bank, normally to a depth of around two feet. At the end of the tunnel is a nesting chamber where the eggs are laid. Our kingfishers have decided to use their previous year's nest which most kingfishers do, unless there is any damage to it. The work continues in spite of the rains. Even a previous year's nest needs a lot of cleaning and repair to the tunnel and nesting chamber. Due to the monsoons, the mountains are now covered in mist. The cleaning has taken our kingfishers three days. Streams have been flowing full now. Fish have started to breed. This morning, the female went in and has stayed there for some time. This suggests that her first egg has now been laid. A season of life. The egg laying continues for four days. On the fourth day, after the laying, the female doesn't come out. She starts the incubation. As evening approaches, most birds come to the water to drink and have a bath. Both the parents perform the incubation duties. The night duty of incubation is only performed by the female bird. She enters the nest late evening and stays in the entire night. Early next morning, a beautiful bronze-backed tree snake is basking in the sun. As I wander down lower stream, I see a kingfisher. First, I think it's a common kingfisher but there is something different about it. On close observation, it's a blue-eared kingfisher, another one of the resident forest kingfishers in these parts. I decide to follow this bird. But she has a suitor. He has a fish in his beak. I admire his persistence, but she plays hard to get. I guess she's testing his commitment. His persistence is finally rewarded. Both he and I were pretty relieved when the female finally accepted his gift. Back at the ODK nest, the incubation is still going on. Each session can last anything from two to four hours. The maximum time the eggs are left unattended is around 15 to 20 minutes. Unlike the ODK, these birds are exclusive fish eaters. There is one sure sign that the two kingfishers are a couple. Their engagement is only complete when the female has accepted the fish from the male. They will rely heavily on the strength of this bond in the months to come. I have never been able to observe their breeding. The next few days are spent feeding. The fantail flycatcher has now made its nest. The blue-eared kingfishers are using a previous year's nest. 
This morning, the female is at her regular perch. The male is nowhere to be seen. She calls, and there is a response. I can't see the male, but it's him. There he is. The Western Ghats are one of the most important biodiversity hotspots in the world. They have a profound effect on the climate and lifestyle of India. The blue-eared female has started laying eggs. The rains have been relentless. There is a forecast of heavy thunder and showers over the next few days from the weather department. It's been raining for nearly two days non-stop. I haven't been able to visit the guards. I've seen whole mud banks go down in such nights before. On the morning of day three, I drive out to the guards. It's still raining. I'm really worried, hoping beyond anything else that all would be well. I see the male bird outside. The entrance of the nest has water flowing over it. It's blocked. I'm anxious about the other bird. Is she inside? The nest entrance is absolutely blocked. I'm getting more apprehensive. Oh. But wait a minute, that's the second bird, so both of them are out. The rains continue. The nervous birds are still outside. For hours I've been observing them, which sadly means the eggs have gone unattended for a long time. This turned out to be a failed nesting attempt for the ODK. An immense loss indeed. Nature can be tough. The next morning, I find the common kingfisher hunting. They have chosen a nest site and have started to dig the nest tunnel. Both birds take turns, as it's hard work digging a tunnel which may be three feet deep. It may take them up to 10 days to dig the nest tunnel and egg chamber. The male strengthens the bond by offering a fish to the female. This strong bond is important as it takes a huge collaborative effort to raise the brood. Courtship feeding takes place many times during this period. Down in the fields, the rice has grown and is now ready for the transplanting stage. Seedlings that were previously planted in one corner are now distributed. It's a huge effort and a very tedious job.
a common kingfisher flies by. A pair of white-breasted kingfishers wait by the fields as ploughing and other activities continue. Experience has taught them that this is a time to feed, and the farm activity rewards them with crabs and other prey items. Rains continue. The common kingfisher female preens after the rain. Back at the ODKs, they are still around, but not yet in a mood to nest again. These birds are known to raise two broods a season. I guess they know something I don't. The breeding pattern of the ODK is hugely affected by the monsoon. The Iora chicks have hatched and the parents are busy with the feeding. That's nature. Here, the fittest and the smartest survive. As the monsoon continues, the Malabar gliding frogs breed. Tadpoles can be seen in most of the pools. The ODK enjoy fishing for tadpoles. In the morning, I visit the ODKs. The ODK flies into the undergrowth, a shikra. That's what has caught its attention. This is still a young bird, but in spite of that, it's a skillful predator. Two years ago, there was record of a shikra picking up an ODK in front of some bird watchers in Goa. It's vital for our ODK to stay hidden and hold its nerve. Our ODK has been lucky. In the natural world, danger lurks in every corner. The great hornbills, one of the largest birds found in the guts. These hornbills are key indicator species of any forest. I manage to see them hardly once a year. And yet their presence still reassures me that this forest is doing all right, even after so much pressure and interference from humans. The hornbills act as the widest seed dispersion agents in these gardens. Mornings have started to be more and more hazy. The rains seem to have subsided. At the blue-eared nest, the chicks have hatched. The parents now face the big task of feeding these chicks. Blue-eared live exclusively on fish, and disappearance of the rain spells trouble for them. The drying streams and shrinking pools are a worrying sign. The rain clouds have now completely disappeared. Lack of rainfall has resulted in the drying up of streams and smaller pools of water getting stagnant and heated up due to the sun. Bad time for the kingfishers. Fish die in these places due to lack of oxygen and the heating up of the water. However, it looks like someone else is feeding on the dead fish. A civet, probably. The ODK pair are still not nesting. They're waiting for favorable conditions to return. I arrive at the blue-eared nest in the morning to hear the jungle babblers giving alarm calls. It's a rat snake, a really enormous one, 
These are known to raid burrowing bird nests to devour eggs or chicks. It's a really dangerous time for the blue-eared pair, with food being scarce and this danger lurking in the vicinity. Morning, my worst fears come true. The nest is empty. It's been raided. The parent birds are just sitting outside. Looks like the rat snake came again at night. I'm not sure with the drying up of so many streams whether the blue-eared pair would have been able to raise their young anyway. The pools with the fingerlings are drying fast. Only the return of rains can save them. The whistling schoolboy of the Garts is busy with its nesting activity. The weather office has issued a warning that India's monsoon rains could be below average in 2015 due to the impact of the El Nino weather pattern. Hearing a lot of hornbills, I decide to check on them. There they are, on a fig tree. There are always some figs fruiting, and hornbills enjoy them a lot. The Malabar pied and Malabar grey hornbills are most commonly seen around here. With rare sightings of the great hornbill. With the rains away, I decide to wait up in the guards today and attempt to locate the evening roost of the ODK. I have never been able to locate these birds roosting at night. This guy decides to take advantage of my vehicle lights to fish in this small pool. I see thousands of flying foxes coming towards the guards. Not normal, probably due to the fruiting figs. As night draws in, the frog orchestra begins. They are all there, wrinkled, dancing, bush, and the odd Malabar gliding. Interesting to see a bamboo pit viper on the hunt. Also reminds me to watch my head, for these are boreal hunters. The wrinkled frog eggs. A roosting bird, finally. It has yellow. It's a golden oriole. At least I have started finding roosting birds. Seems a good sign. One more roosting bird. It's a Tikal's blue flycatcher this time. Still not able to locate the ODK. I'm also looking for the bush frog, which I can hear morning and night, but never seem able to locate it. That's one male bush frog displaying. And finally, there it is, the rainbow-coloured ball all curled up with beak tucked nicely in the wing. Dreams do come true. It's one of those wonderful moments, being able to see it and even film it at night. On my way, deciding to visit the ocean tomorrow morning to find out where the rains are. The rain clouds are back. The sea gets the rains first this time, and then it will come up the guards. On my way back, I stop at a reservoir to see the rains come up over the guards. It's such a relief that the rains have come back to the guards. Guess the ODKs have been waiting for them to return too.
In the morning, I go to visit the ODK pair to find this exquisite vine snake in my path. These hunt for unwary reptiles and birds. A spitting spider preys on other spiders. I find the pair in the vicinity. I'm just wondering if they will start nesting again. I'm so relieved to find that they have started to build a nest again, this time in a more open place than before. This may give me an opportunity to observe them closely. It's a huge task again, digging the nest. They conduct joint inspections. They really need to be extra careful this time, as they cannot afford a second disaster. A Malabar giant squirrel is overhead. The male brings a gift to reaffirm the bond between them, but it's the female who decides when it's right to start. Mid-August brings interesting cloud formations, like these iridescent clouds, caused by tiny water droplets or small ice crystals individually scattering light. Rice fields are growing. Some have turned a bit yellow due to lack of rain, but they will be all right as the rains are back. It takes them six days to complete the nest digging. The Garth slopes are now dominated with beautiful lavender-colored flowering. The local name of this is Karvi. Morning visit to the ODKs, and I find them calling. Are they ready to start? It's very reassuring to find them courting and see the bond getting stronger, a sure sign that they are going to start. I again visit the slopes to enjoy the Cardiffy flowering. They have an unusual flowering pattern and only bloom once every eight years. 2015 is that year when Cardiffy is in full bloom in my part of the gardens. A deadly saw-scaled viper sitting at the base of a Cardiffy bush. Snakes normally avoid humans and won't attack unless provoked. It's morning, and I find our kingfishers courting. While on the bank of the stream, I find a dead common kingfisher chick. It probably died of starvation. That's what kills most of the chicks in their first year. The ODK is an absolute opportunist and will try its luck with anything that moves. That's the key to their survival. The return of the rains has brought bloom to many plants, like this Lear indica. It attracts a huge number of visitors, like the small sunbird. The hummingbird hawk moth is special and very difficult to capture. Butterflies can be found feeding on this throughout the day. Next morning, 
I find the female ODK entering the nest and spending some time there, a sure sign that she has started laying eggs. It's been four days since the first egg was laid. It's September now, and the parents start to incubate. There are four eggs in the clutch this time around. When the bird enters the chamber, it makes a very unfamiliar sound of trunk, trunk. No one knows the significance of this sound. The rice in the fields has now started flowering. September also heralds the annual arrival of the beautiful small flowers blooming on the mountaintops. This year, due to the break in the rains, there are quite a few species that have not blossomed. About 90% of all El Nino years have led to below normal rainfall in India. It's a great time for pollination and pollinators. Kingfishers start incubation from the laying of the last egg. This ensures that all chicks hatch on a single day. This is the best way to avoid sibling rivalry due to size. It's always wonderful to see these exquisite and colourful carpets on these mountains. Not all is pretty in these gardens, though. There are roads that cut through the forest and divide the habitat. Speeding vehicles present a great danger for the inhabitants of these pristine jungles. Almost nothing is spared. Birds, mammals, snakes, everything falls prey to this. It's up to us to be more responsible when we drive through their jungle. A few years ago, a male ODK was killed by a car, and that in turn killed all the five chicks that were almost old enough to fledge from the nest. It's now 17 days since the last egg was laid. I see the eggshells below the nest. The chicks have hatched. That's the first feed they get. Each visit, only a single chick can be fed. The parents still brood the chicks for some time to keep them warm. In a nest above the ODK, the monarch flycatcher chick has fledged. The parents have a huge task at hand, feeding this young one. During the first few days, the ODK parents bring in smaller feeds. From day four onwards, the feeds brought in are pretty big. Geckos, skinks, spiders, fish. A huge array of different food is served by the parents. This is the key to their fast growth. Other smaller kingfishers like the blue-eared and the common rely only on fish. The super adaptable ODK on the other hand feeds on a huge variety. It's pretty rare to find both birds coming together. However, this time, I have seen it many times. Failure of the first clutch might have put them under added pressure to make this one successful.
chicks always compete for being fed the first. The rice is now turning golden. The parents come with food nearly every 15 minutes. They have a formidable task of feeding these fast-growing chicks. Feeding continues from daybreak to sunset. The parents no longer stay in the nest at night. The chicks are on their own during the night. The parent birds are super busy now, keeping pace with the growth of their young ones. The rice on the plains has now ripened, getting very near to the harvesting time. Evening brings around congregation of the swifts before they all roost for the night. It's the twentieth day from the time the chicks hatched. It's time for them to get out of the nest. The parents perform an interesting trick to lure them out. A feed is brought, but not given to the chicks. In a bet that, feeling hungry, the chick should exit the nest, it's one of the most memorable moments to watch. Down at the stream, the Malabar whistling thrush is enjoying its morning bath. The chicks are out. They exit the nest and fly absolutely directionless outside. And it's now a huge task for the parents to get them together. All four are now out. The female bird manages to lure one chick. The others are rounded up by the male. There is a constant calling going on, with the parents and the chicks exchanging contact calls to keep track of each other. They have all the beautiful colours of their parents, but none of their skills yet. Now the parents have one of the most difficult tasks to perform, to take the chicks out of the nesting area and deeper into the forest. This is probably done for a few reasons. One being the chicks will not occupy the parents' territory. Hence, competition for food is avoided. And another might be that deeper in the forest, it may provide better protection. Once they go in deeper, it will be very difficult to track them down. Next morning, I watch from the guards as a Malabar pied hornbill preens. Below, the rice is being harvested. The break in the rains has not affected the rice crop around the guards much. I decide to track the parents and chicks deeper into the forest.
That's one, two, three, and that's the last one, the fourth chick. Chicks learn everything watching the adult birds. And that's what is going to be key to their survival. I found all four chicks within a patch of 30 meters and the parents attending to them. A chick is absolutely motionless. Looking up, I find a rufous woodpecker. It's no threat to them, but their instincts tell them to be wary of anything strange. They have to learn the art of hunting if they are to survive till the next season when they can breed. No one yet knows how many of these chicks survive to the next season. One study on the common kingfisher suggests only a quarter of the chicks make it to the next season. It's been four days since the chicks came out of the nest and their parents are feeding them. They normally would feed them for five days. The parents have stopped feeding the chicks now completely. They are now on their own. This one sees its mother and goes and tries to beg for food, but she wants nothing more to do with it and drives it away. They have to fend for themselves. They have to learn and survive in this world all by themselves. My time in the guards for this year is over, but I will return again next year to witness the marvelous spectacle of monsoons in these guards. For these last six years, this is what I have done, and this has become a huge part of me.